talked about a couple of static prediction techniques. So one technique was that you know it's very simple. You, you just decide to say the same thing for every branch. It is either always not taken or always taken. Okay, right? Um, so for for loop branches, we said that um, always taking is going to be pretty good. Actually. If you have a loop of n iterations, um, you will mispredict over the last time. So you have fairly high uh, accuracy. Um, slight improvement upon that is forward not taken and backward taken. And here we say that um, so this this particular decision is uh, taking in favor loop branches. So, which are mostly taken, <coughs> they are backward branches. Whereas forward not taken comes from the fact that in if else type of constructs, uh, most often we execute the if block than the else block. <coughs> now, um, <coughs> so these are all static techniques. You can fix the prediction at compiler. By looking at the source code, you can say, okay, <coughs> the backward branch, I'm going to say taken all the time. This is a forward branch, I'm going to take, I'm say always not taken. Okay, so there is nothing to do at runtime because we can make a prediction static. However, that's not enough. So um, the problem arises as your uh, pipeline gets bigger. That is, we have just talked about pipe stages. Okay? But usually today processors have much deeper pipeline. And the reason for having a deeper pipeline is that it buys in frequency. Because the simple reason is that as you cut down pipeline stages into smaller sub-stages, you can, your cycle time is determined by the longest stage, right? So naturally, your cycle time goes down. Right? So they block the processor at a higher frequency. So here's an example, uh, just, to, uh, just to convey what really happens uh, if you have a deeper pipe than what we have discussed, or, although this is not a very deep pipe. So after instruction fetch, MIPS R4K um, takes two pipe stages to compute the target, and one more to evaluate the condition. So essentially what I'm saying is that you have the instruction fetch stage, and then you have three more stages until you know for sure the target and the condition. All right. So target is known here, and the condition gets evaluated here. All right. And then of course you have more pipe stages to access memory, etc. Not important for this particular right. example. So, um, <coughs> so let's assume that we have a program which has 4% unconditional jumps, 6% um, not taken conditional branches, and 10% taken conditional branches. All right? And we'll, we'll just ignore everything else. We'll assume that everything else has CPI of 1. Right? So the question is evaluate CPI increase for three schemes. So we have three options in our branch predictor. Right. One is unconditional flush. That is, whenever you come across one of these three types of one of one of these two types of instructions, that is unconditional jump or a conditional branch, what you do is you insert no ops into the pipeline until you know the target for unconditional jumps and target and the condition for conditional branches. Right. Second option is predicted always taken. It is this one. So whatever maybe that is, you predict take it all the time. The third option is predict it always not. Okay. So you have to evaluate these three options um, uh, in terms of the CPI. Right. So let's do that. So first you have to figure out how many bubbles you need to insert in all these cases. These three cases right. so, um, so for unconditional jumps, let's first focus on the first one. Okay. Unconditional flush. Okay. That is whenever you come across uh, an unconditional jump or a conditional branch instruction, you insert a norm. Right. So in unconditional jump, how many knobs should I insert? Two, right? Because here I know what I need to do. Because the target is known here. All right. So I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do here. But I know what to do here. Okay. So these are the two bubbles that you go through. All right. So unconditional jump instructions under the unconditional flush model, we'll have a two-cycle branch limit. All right? OK. So in this case, CPI is going to increase by 2. So unconditional flush. So CPI, uh, delta CPI, unconditional flush. So we have two times 
0 0.04 unconditional integer plus what about not taking conditional branches how many how many bubbles yeah how many bubbles in that unconditional class model three right so I have to wait until S3 before I know what to do. Okay. Yeah. So here only I can I'll be able to fetch the correct instruction. Okay. Alright. Same for taking conditional branches. Be it not taken or taken, it's an unconditional flush. So in all in both of these cases, I'll have a branch penalty of three cycles. Okay, right? So three times 0 0.16, right? 0 0.06 plus 0.1. Here to everybody? Okay. So what do I get? 0.56, right? Okay. So that's the that's why CPI increase for unconditional flush. Okay. So now let's take up the next one. Predicted all is taken. Delta CPI always taken. So what about unconditional jumps? How many cycles do I use? In, in the, this prediction model, always taken. What is the branch penalty? You must be debating between 0 or 2, I'm sure. Which one is it? Can it be zero? I don't have a oracle which can tell me a target. I have to wait for two cycles to get a target, right? Right? So two. Okay. So what about not taking conditional branches? How many cycles do I lose? Three, right? I use everything. I make a wrong prediction, right? Okay. Three times point zero six. What about taking conditional branches? Zero. Are you sure? Two, right? I still have to wait for two cycles until I know the target. Okay. I can save the third cycle, of course. Okay. So two times point one. So how much does it come to? Point four six. Right? So you can see that we saved something. We saved data CPR point one, which is a big event. Right? What about the other one? Always not taken. What is your intuition? Which one is what is going to be better in this case? Looking at these instruction. Why is that? Exactly. We have ten percent taking our branches, right? Yeah. So always saying it should be better. We are biased this side. But remember that. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. So let's see what it comes to. So what about um, unconditional jumps? Mm -hmm. Two. What about not taking bound branches? Two. What about taking branches? Three. How much does it come to? Point five. Huh? Okay. So it depends on your program. Which one is going to be better? Okay, so uh, and you can guess what happens if my pipe gets even bigger, even even deeper, right? If I I could chop down these pipe stages even into half, right, to gain in terms of frequency, my branch penalty is going to increase even further, all right? So um, so that justifies this particular statement: deeper pipelines increase branch penalty, all right? So must have better branch predictors for deeper pipes. 
All right. So if you are really targeting a very fast clock frequency for your processor, you better have a smart department that can design good branch managers. Okay. So this is just one requirement for a deep pipe. We'll see many more requirements as we go along. Okay. So just getting just for getting good frequency, if you make the pipe deeper, you are running risk in other departments. Okay. So keep that in mind. All right. Because, of course, you will reduce your clock cycle time, but you will gradually increase your CPI. And remember that it's a product. CPI time, cycle time will be your performance given constant number of instructions. Okay. Any question on this example? Okay. All right. So I'll start again with one compiler technique before we go into uh, dynamic branch prediction. And uh, this again comes from MIPS. So the MIPS engineers soon figured out that filling the branch base slot is problematic. Okay. Um, often you'll find that um, you don't have instructions to you know, fill in. You cannot prove that the, the, the produced code is correct. And one option is, of course, that compiler. if the compiler could predict which way a branch is going, then, of course, for the predicted path, it could put something in the data slot. But that's also very difficult, predicting strategy. Um, so if you cannot prove correctness of prediction, it has to be conservative, meaning that you'll actually be filling the DNS with a more. Essentially, you're wasting the DNS So some ISS provide a nullifying branch or branch likely instruction. Okay. What is that? Compiler encodes the predicted direction in the instruction and fills the DNS accordingly. So compiler, when compiling the program, makes a prediction, okay. which may be correct, maybe not. Okay. And based on that prediction, it fills the delay slot accordingly. It will, it will actually pull up an instruction from the predicted path and put in the delay slot, which may actually be wrong. All right. So now, um, if at runtime the branch turns out to behave otherwise, the delay slot is flushed. Okay. So when the program finally executes, you find that oh, the compiler made a wrong prediction, which means the delay slot should not actually be executed. All right. So at that time, what it means you cancel the delay slot. You turn it into a norm. At runtime. So why is it any better compared to not having such an instruction? Sometimes it, it will be correct. Sometimes it will be correct, right? So it gives the compiler more freedom, more leeway to actually be to be to be more aggressive. It can actually make a prediction and have more options to fill up the resource. Some of which will actually be correct. Okay. So uh, MIPS offers an instruction called cancel if not taken branch. So, um, so that if the compiler thinks that the branch will be taken, it can fill the delay slot from the target. And of course, at runtime, if you find that the branch is actually not taken, you can cancel the delay slot. Okay. Right? Okay. So, um, why didn't they have a cancel if taken branch instruction? They have only one flavor of this: cancel if not. So it has it says something here. We need parenthesis. Can somebody decrypt that? And then so what? Suppose most of the time it's taken, yeah. So why why shouldn't I have an instruction which is cancelled if taken? Yeah, why is that? Going to be taken, so exactly. So I, I need this kind of an instruction, which will be actually useful on the last branch when you fall through the last iteration of the loop, right? Okay. Yeah. So this decision actually was taken to favor loops, which actually forms a large body of code structures. Um, we usually run loops a lot. Okay. So they found that they, they ran, you know, they took statistics and found that cancel if taken is not that useful. That's why they didn't support this. Instruction. MIPS has only br one branch like instruction, which is cancelled if not taken. Okay. Right. Is this concept here, branch like? It's definitely a big improvement on top of not having one such instruction okay. and, and telling the compiler to fill up the video okay. All right, so, um, so, just to for so now we'll move on to look at dynamic prediction techniques. So, just to formalize the notion of that. So uh, this comes from the, the, the general phenomena called control dependence. Right? Um, and 
roughly every fifth instruction is a branch. So that, that's a known statistics from your program analysis. And you need to be on the right control flow path. That is very important when executing a program. Because this is the source of input to the pipeline. So this determines um, whether the pipeline is, pipeline is wasting time or doing useful work. Okay. If your input is bad, the pipeline is essentially wasting time. Okay. So you want high quality input, meaning that you, you want to be on the right control flow path as often as possible. Static techniques are not enough because you need highly accurate driving predictors, especially when you go for very deep pipelines. Okay. And there is a need to speculate past branches, uh, meaning that you predict a branch, start fetching from the predicted path, and while you're fetching on the predicted path, you may encounter one more branch, which you should be able to predict also and go along the predicted path again. So you may have multiple predictions going on. Okay. Until you resolve the first ones, uh, you really don't know where you're going. But you should be able to do this highly accurate. Okay, so alpha 21264, uh, no longer there actually, this particular company, um, allows 20 outstanding branches, meaning that you can have 20 unresolved predictions. Okay, uh, so that's a, so they put a limit of 20, so which means you predict a branch, you start fetching along the predicted path, you encounter another branch, you should be able to predict that. And depending on this prediction, you start fetching again along that path, you may encounter another branch. You predict that, okay, and the limit is 20. So when you reach 20, they say no more. You have to stall at that point. You cannot fetch any okay. So on, on encountering the 21st branch, the front end of the pipeline will stop, waiting for at the first branch to resolve, or at least one of these branches to resolve. Okay. MIPS R10K allows only four, and this number actually is very important. So we'll soon see actually why. So you need to speculate past predicted branches in deeper pipelines, um, which is actually not a big issue in five stage pipes. Okay, because if you look at the pipeline that we've talked about, you will never encounter this situation that you are on a predicted path and you cannot encounter another branch. Why is that? Because if you remember how our pipeline was, etc. So we are making a branch prediction here, right? in this particular stage. So I'll fetch something here, but this branch will resolve at this stage. Okay, so next cycle I know where to go. So I'll fetch exactly one instruction from the predicted path. Okay. And there is very, you know, of course there is a likelihood, but it's most unlikely that there are two branches. <coughs> okay. Because this instruction has to be a branch also, if you want to be, but this will not be predicted because you will never get to the decode stage if it is mispredicted. Okay. So you will never, never encounter this situation that you are on the predicted path, and you encounter one more branch, which you have to predict. Okay. But if you, if you insert a few more stages here, you can easily see that now that's what will happen. Okay. So um, prediction accuracy is, of course, important, and you want it to be high. Okay. So here is a very quick analysis, um, just to show why this particular number is very important. Okay. So uh, probability of a correct prediction is P, let's say. All right. um, and assuming that these predictions are independent, probability of staying on the correct path after n predictions is p to the power of n. Right? Okay. So now, <clears throat> if you plug in n equal to 20, right? that's what we're saying actually. You have to be on the correct path after 20 such predictions. Okay. So I want p to the power of 20 to be at least 0.5 to make any sense of such a prediction we can. Okay, right? So can you imagine what, what the value of p will be if I want p to the power of 20 to be bigger than 0.5? Sorry? Will be close to one. Close to one, right? Yes. So it turns out to be 0.97. So I'm demanding a branch predictor of prediction accuracy 97%. Okay. To, to, make, to make any sense of this number. Okay. Um, if you have p to the power of 4, uh, p comes to about 0.85. Which is, which is probably achievable. Yeah. Okay. So, so this number has, is very important. You cannot just increase this number arbitrarily. That will harm your chance of being on the right path. Very soon, what will happen is that you'll be on the wrong path for sure, unless you have a highly accurate predictor. All right? So keep this in mind. So essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to design predictors. The goal is to make p as high as possible. Right? Is this analysis clear to me? 
So uh, let's first try to uh, define the problem uh, more formally. So let's encode each taken branch as one and not taken branch as zero. So the behavior of a conditional branch can be presented as a binary string. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 0, 0, 0, 0. As the branch executes, sometimes it will be taken, sometimes it will be not taken. And, the, and a, what will a loop branch look like? The, the, the branch that ends, ends the loop? <laughs> right, exactly. It will be 1 star 0, right? Right? Okay. So keep on doing 1, possibly 0 times, then you fall. So the problem of direction prediction is essentially design of an estimator that, given an n bit history, tells us the next most likely outcome for a particular static branch instruction. So if I give you a branch instruction, I give you its n bit history, and I ask you to design an estimator, which will tell me the most likely outcome for the next execution of this particular branch. Right? OK, is it clear to you, this particular formulation? So um, what all branch predictors do is they compute the probability of seeing a 0 or 1 given the recent pattern history h of some limited length n. So you have seen the history h of length n. And you ask the probability of getting a 0 or 1 after this. So suppose the number of times um, 0 appears after h is c0 and similarly define C1. Okay. The prediction is 1 if C1 is bigger than or equal to C0 and 0 otherwise. Does it make sense? I have seen more 1s after H than 0, so I say that well, this is the most likely prediction, right? Okay. So instead of actually having two counters, what we maintain is C1 minus C0. So the, the difference is maintained. So that's enough. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. So let the difference counter be CH for a certain history H. So since we, are, we have to design the hardware, we have to decide size of these counters. Okay. So let CH be of k bits length. This is independent of the history length, remember that. It has nothing to do with how long H is. Okay. H may be arbitrary now. Okay. Right. So what does it mean? <coughs> that means CH can count from 0 to 2 to the power of k minus 1. Right. Okay. It's a finite length. On seeing 0 after h, you decrement ch. On seeing 1 after h, you increment ch. All right? And it saturates at boundaries, which means it's a saturating counter. Okay. So it does not decrement below 0 or increment above to the power of k minus 1. All right? So by examining ch at any point in time, what can I say? We can say which outcome had higher likelihood in the last to the power of k occurrences of history h. Right? Because I, have, I can only count in this range. So if the, if the counter value is 10, I can say that, well, 1 appeared 10 times more. Sorry. So you have to, you have to okay. So you need to shift the origin to the midpoint first. Okay. So 2 to the power of k minus 1. Is the okay. So from the distance from the midpoint, if you are below the midpoint, you know that you have seen more zeros than 1s. If you're above the midpoint, you, you know that you have seen more ones than zeros. Right? However, that you can do, that you can say only about the last two to the power of k occurrences. Because if you go up gradually, suppose you're seeing ones, okay, you go up gradually saturate here, not move any further. Okay. So you cannot really say beyond that point what happened. Okay. Um, so if ch is below the midpoint, the prediction is zero, otherwise one. Is this algorithm clear to you? Sorry? Oh, you want an example? Yeah, sure. So I have a counter. Let's suppose k equal to 10. Okay. 10 bits long. All right, okay. So what is the midpoint? 512, right? Okay, so that's my threshold, 512. Okay. And I have a history. So that corresponding to this particular counter. So our history can be something like 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc. Okay, so, so here let's suppose I fix 8 bits of history. Okay. This is my H. All right. So what this counter maintains is after this history H, whenever this history H occurs, if a 0 comes, this counter value will be decremented. 
If a 1 comes after this history, this counter value will be incorrect. Alright? Now suppose at some point in time I found the counter value is 20. What can I say for this value? Well, I can probably say that 490, sorry, say 490? 492? Zero more than one. Exactly, yes. So, so this much is the deficit, right? Okay, this many zeros I have seen more than once after H. Okay. But that I can say for sure only in this span. In the last 1023 occurrences of H, this is what has happened. Okay. I cannot see beyond that actually because of this limited length of the company. Alright? Sir, our range should be 5, 1, 2, it's like, if you are getting all ones, then after 2h1 and minus 1, k minus 1, we can't say about that. If you get all ones, you come to here, okay? After that, we cannot predict anything. No, you can still predict. Whenever you see 1, 0, you will start moving in this direction, right? If you want 0, 0. Then it's fine, I'll predict 1, right? That's what it says. If ch is below midpoint, the prediction is 0, otherwise, you cannot add anything. You can't add anything to that, but my prediction is still correct. Right? I'll just stay here at this point. I'll saturate it. Okay. Right? Any question on this? Are we done? Do we have a branch predictor? Or well, not yet. We still have to determine one small thing. How many different histories do we want? Here we are focused on only one counter corresponding to one history. Now each branch can have millions of different histories. And there may be thousands of branches in a particular program. Right? So um, let's start with the simplest option. Suppose we don't have any history. Okay. We have no story. <coughs> what does it mean? You just have a global counter that counts occurrences of zeros and ones. So there is no history. Whenever I see a zero, I decrement the counter. Whenever I see a one, it decrement, decrement the counter. So, um, so it's not very useful actually, because all it is telling you that, well, however many branches I have seen, this many branches are taken, this many branches are not taken. It gives me the difference of that. Of course, based on that, I could make a prediction. I said, well, this program seems to be biased towards taken branches. So I, I say that I, still, I say taken when the value of the counter is above the threshold, otherwise I say okay. So based on the last 1024 branches I have seen, I make a prediction essentially based on the population of the of the binary string. So it's not used in any, any process because it's not very accurate, as you can guess. Alright, so the, what is the next option? Uh, yeah, so sorry. Um, so here essentially uh, um, so you can you can improve this a little further. You can say that well, I still have no history, but I'll maintain one counter to approach. Right? So um, it's somewhat useful because it helps identify large bimodal distributions. Because what is it giving you? You have one counter per branch. Okay, all right. And that counter is telling you the behavior of this branch. And you'll be able to detect the bimodal nature of the branch. That is, if the branch is largely biased towards not taken or largely biased towards taken, you'll make mostly correct predictions for those branches. But a branch which fluctuates in between, you know, you probably make a large number of mistakes. So this is called a bimodal predictor, and this is actually used in many processors. Okay. So one counter, it's not exactly one counter per branch, you actually use a hash table for of counters. Okay. All right. So the bimodal branch predictor, essentially it's a table of counters, table of saturated counters. And you take the branch PC, shift out the last two bits as always. Take a module of number of counters you can afford. Let's call it to the end. This one. Right. So if I have two to the end counters here, each k bits. That's my bimodal branch predictor. So this predictor will work extremely well for branches which are primarily not taken, it's primarily taken. But it won't be able to detect any pattern in branches. That's impossible. Because it doesn't have any history. 
which is only counting the number of zeros and ones in a sequence. Is it clear to Bible number two? Right. Okay. So from no history, let's make one small step. Suppose we give you a one global history register. That means you still don't have one history per branch, but you have one history register where whenever you see a branch, you shift in its outcome. So the, if you have a history of say n bits, you know the outcome of the last n branches that you have seen. Right. So it captures cross correlation between branches if there is any. All right. Since history is a sliding pattern, H will keep on changing. Okay. It's not a fixed history that you are maintaining. So H will gradually keep changing. It will just capture the sliding window of pattern. Okay. So now the question is okay, fine, I have this history. Should I have one counter for each history pattern? So usually people use a hash map again. So what does it look like? You have a global history register. Of some length, small m, let's say. Which will be used to index into a bank of counters. To be the m counters. Okay. So can somebody tell me what am I doing here? So whenever I see a new branch, what I'll do is I'll shift this register by one bit position and shifting the new new outcome of this branch. So it is capturing the outcome of last n branches. It's a binary string. So what is it learning actually? So of course the prediction mechanism is still the same. I, whenever I get a branch, I use the current content of the global history register, look up the corresponding counter, okay. all right? Yeah. And if the counter is above 2 to the k minus 1, I say the branch is taken. If it is below 2 to the k minus 1, I say the branch is not. So what is it doing? No, 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 I'm not asking you to asking you to come up with program constructs where this is going to be good or bad. I'm just asking what what is it doing? Can somebody articulate that in English? Does it make any sense? That's the first question. Is it doing anything useful? So what will what will the number in a particular counter correspond to at any point in time? Sorry? By the group of which branch? By the group of branches. Is it? Is it by the group of branches? The last time. What is this counter attached to? Each counter is attached to something very unique. What is that? How do I index into a counter? What do I use to that? Do that? Yeah? Now, what, what is this? I use a history, right? To index into a particular counter. So the history attached to a particular counter will remain same throughout, right? Do you see that? This counter will get indexed only when I see a particular history here, right? Okay. So if I assume that there is no aliasing, meaning that I have enough counters here, each history gets a new counter in this table, right? So now somebody can tell me what is this actually measuring this particular counter? How many times in this kind of situation? After time, what? Exactly. So this counter is telling me that the history corresponding to this counter, how many times that had a zero after that history, and how many times that had a one after that history. It is measuring the difference of that. Okay. Right? So each counter gets attached to a particular history. It doesn't have anything to do with a particular branch. 
So when a branch shows up with a particular content of the global history, so that means I'm asking, well, tell me in the past what happened when you saw this history. Was it a zero after this or a one after this? And that's what this count is going to tell you. The most likely outcome. Right? Okay, so um, that's a huge improvement over no history. Okay. So this predictor has very high accuracy actually. Right? Um, <clears throat> so we'll actually soon come up with the taxonomy of predictors. So I'm just giving you the glimpses. Okay. I'll soon name these predictors. They have names. And then, of course, you can extend it, say that, well, instead of a global history, I could have one local history per branch. So I make this a table instead of a single register. Right? Okay. So this is not a global history register anymore. This becomes a history table. And I'll index it with, can anybody guess? I want a local history per branch. What do I index it with? Branch piece. Right, exactly. So if I have 2 to the p entries here, I'll essentially do pc shifted by 2 and then with 2 to the p minus 1. That's why it index. Okay. So even though I may not have um, one history per branch if my table size is limited, I'll at least have, you know, there may be some collision, of course. But in a, if in a region of a program, as, as, as long as I have no more than 2 to the p branches, I'm happy. Because I don't really care when I move on to a new region of the program, what happened in that region. Right? So um, hash history patterns to counters, um, but it loses global cooperation. Now, you will not be able to see if there is a relationship between this branch and this branch, these histories, which you actually were having when you had a global history. So these are roughly three types of branch predictors that you see. Um, so I'll, I'll soon come up with a naming convention for this. Uh, so any question? So this predictor is not very slow. It's like uh, we are uh, updating it, we are reading it, and then we compute something. We updating? Have, there is no update going on yet. We are updating uh, the uh, uh, counter registry. Uh, when the branch finally executes, yeah. you will update this and this both. Yeah. yeah but that's not the time of prediction. That's better. At the time of prediction, you look this up. After that, you, you look this up, and you make a prediction. And when you when you finally execute the branch, you know the correct outcome. At the time, you can update it. You cannot update with the predicted outcome. This has to be correct all the time. Whatever you learn. Okay. In future, when we get the outcome of yes, you can exactly. Yeah. Yes. Can we mix both of them? Ah, yeah, of course, of course, you can mix. You can mix as many as you want. Yes, we talk about this. Yes, yes. Any other question? So we have already talked about this one, bimodal predictor. So some names here. The table of counters is called a branch history table, so that you have multiple branches mapping to the same entry. And in some cases, that that may be very very bad. Two branches may be behaving in two different ways. They map to the same entry. One will increment, one will decrement. You get nothing. Else. How wide is each counter? Do you really implement a counter? Well, how wide is each counter? So that determines how, how, how far you can see the span of your, uh, your window. Okay. You actually don't really implement a counter here. You just have a finite state machine implementing a saturating counter. So you know when the state is 0, 1, when you, uh, when you have to implement a particular counter value, what will be next? It will be 1, 0. Okay. Actually, you don't implement a counter. You just implement a finite state machine. You post two states given a particular Okay. Performance of loops on the bimodal predictor. How will it be? Mm -hmm. Good, bad? Yeah. Always good. So we're talking about this predictor, if you have forgotten. We talked about it five times, uh, sorry, <laughs> five minutes ago. So we have branch history table, which is k bits wide. This is a bank of saturated counters indexed with some function of the branch PC. The function is basically a modular hash. So we're asking, what can you say about a loop branch? Like you receive that. Excellent. 
how the conditions actually will be correct. Except the last one. Except the last one. The last one. Does it have any relationship with K? Uh, are you assuming something about K? Previous K. Previous what? K. I tell you that K is very important here. Why? What happens if K is very large? This should, I thought this should be an easy question. You see a loop, it keeps on incrementing the count rate. The stake is gradually. Last time it increments. What happens if the, if the value of K is large? It's a very wide count rate. We don't need a large contract. Julie? We don't need a large contract. I, 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 I'm just trying to figure out if I have a large contract, what will happen? Okay, tell me what will happen. So if you, okay, if you cannot think in abstract terms, I can give you values. Suppose k is 10. I have a loop of 100 iterations. What will happen? Not wrong saturated. Very good. Okay, so what? Or it may saturate. You're assuming something. Where do I start from? Did I say anything about that? No. So what makes sense? What's the initial value of these counters? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Middle? Mm -hmm. um, okay, if I start in middle, what will happen? If I have 100 iterations, I should be fine, right? I'll make a misprediction in the last last branch. Now the thing is that these counters are actually initialized to zero when the machine boots up. So if I assume <coughs> it's, at, that's, it's at zero, if I have a counter of 10 bits and a loop of 10, 100 iterations, what will happen? I'll accept, except the last time I make misprediction all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I'll never be able to cross the threshold. So usually, these counters are small. You'll often find two, maybe three bits, never more than that. So I, I really don't want a very large history. I want a small window. I want to know what happened in that small window. That's it. So I don't need a large window. Because the problem is that often having too much of history may pollute your prediction. Because what happened in distant past we have not changed actually, that behavior. You may not see that behavior. So usually these counters are small to capture a small window of history. Okay. All right. So um, what about alternating branches? Alternating branches have this particular pattern. What will happen to them? Prediction accuracy? 50%. 50%? Are we assuming something about the initial value? Mid, right? Um, if I initialize it to 0, 50%, right? If I initialize it to somewhere, if the counter is too large, and if I initialize it to on this side, still 50%, right? Okay. So, so it's not very useful, that's what it means. If you have 50% correct, that's more or less random, right? I could make a random prediction. I could cross, a, cross an unbiased point and be happy. So alternating branches, we need something better. Bimodal, bimodal predictions are not good for this. Okay. Right. What about correlating branches? There is branches that have relationship across them. I have an example. Ah, yeah, yes. So suppose we have this program. If f is equal to x, then you assign y to f. Okay. If g is x, then you assign y to g. And then you say if f not equal to g, you lose it. So do you see that the outcome of this branch depends on the outcome of the previous two branches, right? Okay. So this is called a globally correlated uh, branch ensemble. Okay. So you have a branch which depends on the history of few other branches. So this, so even if I tell you the exact history of this branch, it will be very difficult for you to predict what's going to happen next time when this branch exists. 
But if I tell you the history of these two branches, you probably will come up with a correlator very easily. The pattern will emerge immediately. <coughs> that hey, look, if these two branches, these previous two branches behave like this, I'm getting this. You catch the pattern immediately. Okay. Right? Is it clear? So this requires two levels of table. So these are the levels of table. The, the second level table is the branch history table, as we just mentioned. Okay. And this one is called the pattern history table. And this table may have even just one entry. That's also fine. That's still called a pattern history table. For example, if we have just a global history register, that will still be the pattern history table, but having just one entry. Okay. So then we can come up with a taxonomy of branch predictors, um, depending on how you exactly index in the first level table and the second level table. So the first level table can either be global, can be per set, or per branch. Okay. So what does that mean? If it is global, that means you just have one register, the global history register, where you maintain the history of all branches. So whenever you encounter a branch, you shift this bit one, one, one position to the left, and you shift in the new outcome. All right? And all the branches are mixed up here. Right? So that's called a global first level table, or the global pattern history table. Right? Then you can have par set, where essentially what you do is you have a table, and a set of branches get one entry into the table. So that will happen when you take the PC and do a modular operation on that. Right? A set of branches will map to one entry. Right? And then of course you can have par branch entry. You can, if you know beforehand how many branches I'm going to see in my program, you can size the table so that every branch gets exactly one entry. Alright? Is it clear? These three things. Okay. What are the second level table? There also you can do the same thing. You can have a global second level table. That's exactly what that is. That is, there is, there is a, there is no specific table, branch history table attached to one particular counter. Okay. All counter can update any, all history can update any counter here. Okay. But every counter will get attached to a particular history. For example, suppose this counter gets indexed when you have the history 10, 11, 11, one, 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 let's say. Alright? Okay. Now this history may appear sometimes in this particular history entry, may appear in this branch's history sometimes, may appear here sometimes. Okay. So whenever this history history shows up, you will index it to this counter and make an update. So that's very important to understand that these counters are not attached to any specific branch. A particular counter gets attached to only one history. Okay, and that's where the name comes from, global. It's a global branch. <coughs> and then you can have par set branch history table where you say that, well, um, a set of histories will map to a table. So I'll basically have a table for a set of histories. So I'll have multiple second level tables. And the third one says that, well, you can have a part branch table. So that for each entry, I'll have a branch history table. So for that branch, it will have all the histories accumulated in that table's counters. And then you have the update method. Uh, one um, is a static method, usually not used. Okay. So that you hear essentially what you say is that um, you just statically <coughs> encode this table at boot time. You program a table static. Right. So there is no update as such. And the other one is called adaptive update, which is, which is more popular. As you go on, you learn, update the tables. So combining this, people name branch predictors. So first entry here corresponds to the type of the first level table. Second entry here corresponds to the update method. You will invariably find A everywhere. You never see an S here. So these, are all, these are all adaptive predictors. And the last entry corresponds to the type of the second level table. So for example, path basically means what? What will a path predictor look like? So I have a big first level table. 
each branch gets one entry in this, all right? This will point to one branch history table. This one will point to another branch history table. And so on, all right? And how will you update any entry here? So you take the history here, whatever history you have, that will be used to index into all the counters here. And that counter will be implemented. Similarly, the histories used here will be, uh, histories, um, histories here will be used to update the counters here. Okay, so on and so forth. All right. Is it good or bad compared to that? It's a gigantic predictor. You can easily see that. You have many entries in this table, and each entry will correspond to a table. It's good because multi entries, multi uh, entries won't update one counter simultaneously. Right. Is that so right? It's like uh, if uh, someone is adding something and decreasing something, mm -hmm. so it won't affect our counter as such. No, 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 I don't think it counts. So it's like uh, two is uh, two is that always uh, uh, updating same counter. Yeah. Right? One is adding and um, one is decreasing. Right. So okay. it won't uh, it nullifies the effect. So it won't happen in this case. Right. Exactly. So, um, if you have a particular history, and at, after this, sometimes 0 appears, sometimes 1 appears. Okay, right? So, in that case, what will happen is that, what are we saying? Uh, the effect will be nullified, uh, uh, we are adding and the Right, exactly. So, 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 depending on which branch it is coming from, it may have two different behaviors. Okay, right? But it will update the same counter, actually. So, that may have a destructive interference effect. Is there any good effect? So the, what he has pointed out is a bad thing that we should try to avoid. So that's exactly what he's trying to avoid. So two entries in the table updating the same counter. When is it good? You learn something in one course, learn the same thing in the other course, is that good? Good or bad? You probably learn better, is it? Or you learn faster. So in this case, if there are two histories that reinforce their learning. It's going to learn very fast, actually, at a much faster rate. You reach the, the, the learn pattern quickly. So this is my path predictor. Similarly, you can come up with SAG. SAG is probably the one of the most popular one. That is a SAG predictor. It has a uh, each entry corresponds to a set of branches here, and it's a global table. <coughs> so it will not be of correlating branches. Well, yeah, of course. So, so um, neither SAG, right? So SAG has some, it will be able to learn some correlation. Of provided, provided your, your mapping function will be able to map those correlated branches to the same set. Yeah. Right, yeah, but that's an accident. It's impossible to design such a, such a, such a hash function before. Okay. Yeah, and for that purpose, you use a gag. Okay. You have a global entry in the first level, and uh, you have a global table in the second level. So that will learn your correlating bound filters. So, um, so what does each one buy? This one allows you to learn each branch separately. This one uh, gives you more or less the same accuracy at a much lower cost. This one allows you to learn global correlation across branches. Okay. Um, there is one special case that's called a G share predictor, which is more or less the same as GAG, except that it has a slightly different index function. So you have the global history register as usual. <coughs> and you have your branch history table as usual. So if this is n bits, how many entries do I have here? Sorry? Two rest of bars, man. Before you index it, you do an XOR with PC. I show it as XOR because that's what is used most popularly. But you can come up with other smart functions. Why do I want to do this? G 
share is amazing in code, I can tell you. So it's a good thing to do. Mapping the same branch always to the same Mapping the same branch? Means same DC. Yeah. Map to same entity. No, there is no such guarantee. There is no such guarantee. You are examining it with global history register. You destroy all your pattern elements. What is it trying to do? Why do I bring in the PC? What do I lose in a global predictor? Suppose I have, I don't have this. <coughs> I have the GHR and the branch history data. What is it that I lose? Sorry? Branch wise prediction. Branch wise prediction, right? I, I really don't have any learning about the local history of a branch. Right? So I'm just trying to introduce some flavor of that by exhorting it with PC. Right? The hope is that a particular branch, when it sees a particular history, it will get a particular different entry. Okay. So essentially, I'm trying to map this tuple, PC, GHR, onto these counters. The hope is that each different pair will get a different power. Okay. Of course, I could do other things, like I could catenate these two, but my table will become now gigantic. Okay. So I have to come up with some function. 